Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Gina Louise Shara. I'm the mayor of Northampton. Um, and it's my thrill to welcome you to the third meeting about the Resilience Hub. How's this mic? It feels very loud to me, but are you all good? Excellent. Nice. Thank you for that feedback. Um, so this is the third meeting about the Resilience Hub. This meeting is called Connections and Collaboration and Comprehensive Care. Uh, we like alliteration. Um, once again, I thank you all for coming. I hope everyone who didn't have a chance to tour the building at the last meeting took the opportunity today um, and got to walk around it. Um, or maybe you wanted to take another look in there and imagine. Uh, so in the previous two meetings, we spent some time sharing the high-level vision for the project, the building's history, our hopes for the site, and discussed with a bunch of city leaders about hello, about how the hub will support city needs related to downtown climate resilience, public health and safety, and emergency preparedness. Tonight, we are excited to discuss the integration of services and the role of partnership in shaping a hub that is more than a sum of its parts, focusing on holistic community support. I'm so grateful for all of our partners who've come tonight. Among them are representatives from Community Action Pioneer Valley, our own Division of Community Care, Elliott Human Services, the Three County Continuum of Care, Clinical Support Options, Cathedral in the Night, Mana Community Kitchen, and Hilltown Community Health Center. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to share, for them to share their take on a vision of what is possible for the hub and to answer any questions that you have. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Galad Maroon, um, and um, and I'm just going to tell everyone that I cannot stay very long. I have a city council finance meeting on the budget, so I apologize that just got scheduled last minute. So um, I won't be able to stay, but um, please ask these wonderful people great questions about um, this very important project for Northampton. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, my name is Gilad Marone. I'm the project coordinator for the Community Resilience Hub. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here, especially on such a hot day. Thanks for making it out here. Um, and before we even get started, I just want to acknowledge that the Resilience Hub, as you see from this amazing group of folks, is really a team effort, including the team at Community Action. Um, so I just want to let the other Hub team members who are here with me introduce themselves so you get a sense of who's helping to lead this project. Hi, everyone. I'm Nan Sibley. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Resilience Hub. A large part of the work that I do is engaging with folks who are unhoused and seeking services. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. My name is Caitlin. I am the Community Health Coordinator for the Hub. Hi, folks. My name is Kate Glenn. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator. So my job is to build relationships with our, the business community and um, the broader community in Northampton. Thank you for coming. Thank you all. Um, so I'm really excited to really share the mic today with this amazing group of folks here. Um, but I do see some new faces here. So I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of what the Resilience Hub is, if you're not already familiar. Um, so the Hub is a new community center here in downtown Northampton. Uh, hopefully you got an opportunity to tour the building just up the street before this. Um, and as we've heard from Dory and the JWA team at previous meetings, resilience hubs are community centers to address both short and long-term needs of residents. Uh, what they really do depends on the specific needs of that city or town and the people living there. Uh, but there are some common characteristics across most of them. Uh, first, hubs often support climate resilience. Um, they do this by being spaces that can be warming centers or cooling centers, spaces with backup generators during power outages, places to access food, water, medical supplies, and other types of resources that communities need during climate-related crises, really functioning as a safe space to go to during an emergency to support everyone. Second, resilience hubs are also addressing social connectedness. Um, strengthening our communities um, is really about building stronger relationships between everybody. And hubs play a key role in supporting communities by hosting events, gatherings, classes, summer programs for teens, workshops, places to organize, places to host celebrations. Uh, so hubs really function as a familiar and welcoming place where you can meet your neighbors and, and make new friends. 
And third, uh, resilience hubs often connect residents to short and long-term services. Uh, so this, again, really depends on what local needs are, uh, but this often includes social services like healthcare, employment support, uh, case management, youth programs, food access, legal aid, and, and more. And hubs also often serve as spaces to meet short-term or immediate needs, helping people get a hot meal, use a bathroom, take a shower, or just a place to rest, charge your phone, use the Wi-Fi, get information about the bus schedule. So here in Northampton, we're working to create a resilience hub that does all three of those things. Environmental resilience, community building, and coordination of services. And this is really in response to what we've heard from many people across Northampton, as well as what we've heard from public, private, and nonprofit sectors over the years. And for those of you who are not as familiar with how we got here, uh, a lot of these efforts date all the way back to 2016, when there were community members who were meeting um, at part of a group with Cathedral in the Night, uh, and were advocating that there needed to be a safe space somewhere downtown to access services, get a meal, and rest your feet. Now, at the same time, uh, business owners and downtown stakeholders were advocating that the city should uh, really be supporting its most vulnerable residents and create a space that can meet their needs. And as we'll hear tonight, many nonprofits and service agencies have long been calling for something like the Resilience Hub that would help better connect the dots between all of the amazing organizations that do work in this area locally. Uh, so I'm not going to tell the whole story right now, but the short version is that the city of Northampton really listened to all of its constituents and brought this project to life. And it's a really amazing opportunity to meet many different needs at once. And uh, as I mentioned, really focusing on three areas of impact in particular, environmental resilience, community building, and service coordination. Uh, so tonight, we're really here to talk about the third of those three goals, service coordination. And since the hub is going to work to really connect the dots between many different service providers, we wanted to give you all a window into what that will look like. So we've asked a handful of local leaders to come speak with us tonight about their work and their vision for the hub so we can better understand from the folks leading this work what service coordination will really look like at the hub and what it will do for downtown Northampton. Um, and I just really want to express my gratitude for all seven of these people agreeing to be up here with me tonight. Um, they are really all leaders in the work that they do. And having so many different people from different sectors of work here together represents the kind of collaboration that we hope to build at the Hub. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. And before we actually dive into the questions, I just want to give each of you an opportunity to introduce yourselves and just let everyone know what organization you represent and, and what your role is there. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Andy Kladka. I'm the regional manager with Elliott Homeless Services. We're based here in Northampton, and we do homeless outreach, and we also do um, a small program with housing stabilization. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shondell Diaz. I am the coordinated entry coordinator for the three-county continuum of care. We cover Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire counties and manage a lot of our homeless services. Good evening, I'm Kelly Benezra. I'm the Director of Shelter and Housing for Clinical and Support Options. And we oversee shelter and housing programs uh, in Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin County. And specifically here in Northampton, we oversee the adult individuals shelters. Good evening, I'm Pastor Stephanie Smith. I am the <clears throat> director of Cathedral in the Night, if you haven't heard of us. I always feel like the odd man out is like a church in the middle of all this, but I'm so grateful that we have a town that's so welcoming. But um, So we are an outdoor church. We meet in front of First Churches on Sunday nights, and we provide the meal for Sunday as well. Hi, I'm Lee Anderson. I'm one of the team that makes manna special here in Northampton. We've been here for 35 some odd years, I guess, providing a open meal where people can come and get community and food. Hi, I'm Dr. Jessica Bossi. I work for Hilltown Community Health Centers. We currently provide um, medical services for our houseless um, and housed. Currently working at MANA. Um, we have multiple health centers as well throughout the region. Um, we help provide not only just medical care, but also enrollment in um, health insurance and navigation for those who need that. 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Deputy Commissioner Michelle Fari for the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the public health branch um, within Northampton and serves shared services throughout 14 communities in Hampshire County and as well regionally a substance use outreach program. But I'm here representing the Division of Community Care, DCC, which is the new um, tier of public safety here within Northampton, providing emergency, urgent, and imminent need to people that can walk in or can be referred to us for care. Unfortunately, we only have only one mic tonight, so we'll be passing it a couple of times. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, so um, we've got, I've got a few questions that we're going to be asking um, the folks up here, uh, but um, we also would love to hear from y'all. So we're going to be slowly, while we're asking questions, passing around some pieces of paper and pens. Um, so if y'all have any questions, please write them down, and some folks will be coming around and gathering them, and later on we'll be able to take some questions from all of you. Um, so I'd love to just start by hearing a little bit more about the work that each of your organizations do and, and how the Hub will support that work. Um, I, I would love to, if you could help us understand why you're excited about the Hub and specifically what will it do for your organization's work? How will the Hub support the kind of stuff that you're doing? Can I start with a, a very quick story? Um, j just last week on Sunday, I was with some friends and some people that we also didn't really know, and one of the people that we didn't know started a conversation about the panhandlers and that he had a, a story that he wanted to share around offering this gentleman a, a job. And then he, he quickly had um, a lot of negative sort of focus on what happened after he offered the job, because he said, of course, he didn't want the job. And he had a lot of judgments, I think, that were pre-programmed um, that he shared with us. And I asked him a few questions. I asked him, I said, well, I said that was nice of you to do that. I, I wonder if you thought of all of the other factors that go into having a job and maintaining a job. And so I, I, I quickly mentioned the fact that people generally need to wash their clothes, take a shower, have a, have a meal. Um, sometimes you need to use a phone or a computer. So there's a lot of things that need to happen before someone can get to work and have a job and maintain that job and sustain it. And so for me, this sort of highlighted where we really are in, in our system, that we need a place um, where we can do all of these things. It, it may take six months, maybe longer, to get IDs and documents and birth certificates and all of the documents that you need to start a housing plan, to maybe start an employment plan. Um, and so there's so many things that I think that a lot of folks don't understand that go into um, the goals that we're all um, looking to achieve. There's so much work that has to be done um, for many, many months, sometimes years for folks who have been outside for a long time. Um, they don't have health insurance, they don't have IDs, they don't have any income. And so we're doing all of that work um, often with a, with a lot of people who aren't raising their hands asking for help. And, we're, we're, and we can talk a little bit more about how we do some of the work we do, but we're doing a lot of work, um, and we call it, at, at Elliott, we call it pre-treatment work, and we're getting people ready for the next phase, for the next stage. And we're doing all of these different um, activities, and we're often doing them from, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. We're going out to woods, we're going out to encampments, to abandoned buildings sometimes, um, obviously to shelters. And so having a central location for us has always been a need. It's always been something that we've talked about. And, and, and as these conversations develop, it really feels like a gift. It, it, it's a gift that brings all of us together as providers. It helps us all know each other. It helps with our relationships with one another. And the work that we do can't be done unless we have relationships with, our, with, with the folks that we serve. And so this, this brings all of that together in one place. Um, and, and there's a lot more that I'd like to talk about, but I want to share. But it's, it's the beginning of something, I think, really amazing in allowing the, the, the system to um, continue to coordinate with each other, build relationships, and, and be that bridge to get folks to the next place. So the three county continuum of care, to put it in its simplest term, is a regional systems planning body. 
our main goal is to work towards ending homelessness. We collect the data. We are the ones that provide that data to the US government, to the state government officials, and to HUD so that they can be able to provide us with the funding resources so that they can know um, exactly what the impact of homelessness is in this moment. Um, one thing that I'm just super excited about the hub is that um, you can't ask to hold space within community without being a part of the community, and the hub is definitely a part of the community, and it's going to bring together a lot of the resources that folks need um, into one centralized location. Right now, we hold case conferencing weekly um, per region and um, per population, and um, you know we have people from all around, but actually having somewhere centralized is really key to be able, be able to low, lower barriers to be able to provide resources to folks. Uh, so again, my name is Kelly Benezra, and we oversee the shelter here in Northampton for individuals. And, you know, this is a 35 to 40 bed shelter. Um, and I think you probably are all aware that homelessness is just increasing. And I think one of the things that um, I can say about what we do in the shelter is that we're really integrating services. We have behavioral health and case management services and medical services on site for those individuals that are staying there that need that bed at night. But the reality is, is those services in one location would be beneficial to people who we need to work to prevent from getting into the field of homelessness. Because once somebody ends up there, it is so much more difficult for them to end up in stable housing. And what we want to do as teams is to really support people in managing all of the places that are the barriers that they're already experiencing to keeping, maintaining the housing that they have or finding housing before they have to end up in a shelter system. Um, you know, we as partners with each other also need a place where we get to come together. Um, we do a lot of service coordination as teams. You know, I mean, Dr. Abbasi and I are in touch on a daily basis um, because we're working with the same population, the same folks um, who are staying outside and then ending up in shelter and then ending up back outside. I mean, it's kind of a revolving door. Um, and so that's one of the pieces. There are many pieces that I'm excited about, um, but that is one of them. Again, I'm Pastor Steff from Cathedral in the Night. Um, I'm in a different role because we are not a provider of services, but I really see our role as a place of hope. We are a church, but faith is never a requirement for anything that we do, so we really welcome people as they are. And then our, our job is to helpfully help, help people have hope again. Being outside, um, being economically in poverty, um, it's very degrading and, and people are not always treated very well. And so a lot of times when people come to church on Sunday, they're sort of turned in on themselves. And um, it's our hope to kind of help people feel seen. And, and the biggest part that we do is to be a bridge to connect to other services. I was just thinking one of the things I'm most excited about is half of the people up here I've never met in person till tonight because we have our meetings online because we're super busy and we don't have time to drive to a meeting. We have time to meet on Zoom. But how great it will be to be in one place where we can see each other on a regular basis and better coordinate the work that we're doing. Um, because if I say, hey, have you to Kelly, and they're like, who's Kelly? I don't want to talk to her. And I'd be like, oh no, she's really cool. She's right down the hall. And I know her. And actually, Kelly, would you come have coffee with us down at, in Mana's space? In, not behind a desk, not in an office, like very casual in one building. It will make it so much easier for people to access and feel human and feel like we're building relationships, not just fighting problems all the time. If we keep digging into problems, there's never a bottom. But when we build relationships, we always say it's relationships that change people's lives. It's never stuff. It's helpful. Stuff is helpful. We all need a lot of things. But it's usually, when I ask people what changed in your life, it's a person and it's a relationship. And I think that's the biggest thing the Hub is going to do. If I can build one bridge instead of 100 bridges all over Western Mass, if I can build one bridge to a place where everybody is, 
um, and they know they're going to be treated with dignity and be heard and people will do their best for them, that relationship, I think, will go so much further to building trust and comfort and opening up to, it's very vulnerable to ask for help. It requires a lot. And so I try and, and our staff try and walk with people to do that. And these are the people that make the changes. Um, and so to have that relationship, to have that place where everybody is in one space. And I don't have to say, you have to take this bus, and I don't have bus money, and what day do they do this at that place? And I can just be like, let's go to the hub and find out. And walk down the hallway instead of you know running around town because it's exhausting. People are already tired. Let's not make them more work than they need to. Hi, I'm Lee from MANA. So what the Hub would do for us, and sorry, you know me, I'm going to say a story. But when I started cooking at MANA, there was an outreach worker from Elliott, and he still comes, but he came into the meal one day and said, oh my god, there's so-and-so. I've been looking for her for two weeks, and her camp was abandoned off the bike path, and somebody said she was camping behind Stop and Shop. I went there, and I couldn't find her. And I said, well, why waste your time? She's here every day at 11. Like, just come here. And another partner, Tapestry, who's not here at the moment, but you know, they told me a story once about trying to a new camp off the bike path, and you know, they would walk up on the camp, and the people would just like run away. And I said, well, "What if you take our meals and use that as an icebreaker?" And so, what we're trying to do at at Mana is use the love that our guests that eat at our meal every day have for us, and leverage that for these warm handoffs, or make zero barrier access to Dr. Bossy, for instance, where she's in our space and there's no calories being burned to take care of that wound on your arm. I don't have to like talk to you for two weeks while it's getting worse and worse and you're just not going to go to the ED. There's nothing that's going to get you to the ED unless you are not conscious. And so those are the, the partnerships that we're trying to model at MANA. Um, and, you know, we're pretty much an all-volunteer operation. And with that, there's a generosity and there's a gratitude that our volunteers know by eliminating labels from people. So when you're in our space, you're just another human trying to get, you know, community what you need. It's a safe place to ask for what you need. We might not be able to do it, but we know people that will do it. Or it's going to be working in our brain forever, and we'll figure out a way to have that thing dealt with someday. Um, you know, and, you know, only about 30% of our guests are unhoused. So we deal with all levels of food insecurity. And, you know, in some of the food insecurity is really just Heartbreaking. I mean, you're just um, a single parent making a decision that is my kid going to get sneakers to play in the rec basketball league or are we going to eat Kraft macaroni and cheese for three weeks to pay for them? You know, like those are the things that we do not have to do in Northampton. Like, Mana can provide food for anybody for any reason, whether you just had your knee replaced and you don't want to cook because you don't want to stand on it. Like, those are the things that we can do for people. And along that, we are putting all levels of people together at the same dining room table. So somebody that maybe will have a label on them as unhoused or whatever, if you sit and have a meal with that, you will realize that that is just another person. And that person who maybe is unhoused that thinks that that's just a privileged person that, you know, like they will get that relationship built too. And we will just all be better, you know, for that investment in time. Um, you know, we're all people, we're all just trying to get by, and that, le that thing that happens at MANA every day is what MANA is trying to leverage for all of our other partner agencies. They got zero calorie burn to find Dr. Bossy. She is literally 13 feet away. <laughs> um, you know, Elliott Services, they're literally right there. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And I think we, we've been doing it at some level for, you know, decades in Northampton, but the, the hub is going to make that all that much more possible. Hi, again, I'm Dr. Bossy. We've, I've been mentioned a couple of times here. Um, so I wanted to circle back uh, to what Andy was saying about like the logistics that people don't fully understand when you're working with someone who has nothing. They have no ID, no birth certificate, no bills in their name, no, they don't have a single, they're just, you know who they are, but 
nobody else does. So those folks, the first step is, you know, they be trying to get them a, a driver's or a, an ID from Massachusetts, right? But the first thing they need to do is go get their social security card and we've got to order their birth certificate. For those folks to get a social security card, I, as a doctor, have to write a letter of proof of identity. Like we've looked them up, their social security number in the Mass Health or Medicaid or, or federal, you know, Medicare system. I can prove to you who they are. This is my signature. Take this to Social Security um, to go get your Social Security card. Which then, when you have that and your birth certificate, then you can go to the RMV and get your license. Okay, so that involves me doing something. Sometimes that's a really great way for Andy's team to sort of just open up the door that there's a doctor who doesn't work in, you know, this fancy health center or hospital who can actually provide some kind of initial help just to get something basic done. Um, I had to get a birth certificate for a person who didn't have anything out of Connecticut recently, and we ended up asking the police station to provide a letter in addition to my letter of identity that included her fingerprints that she was she did exist and she said she was who she said she was. So that's how that's how difficult it can be just to get this process started. All of that is is generally aiming at getting someone something called cash assistance, which is $404 a month. That helps them like pay for a cell phone so we can know where they are or remind them of their appointment, um, you know, talk to their caseworker, get to me. That also requires my signature. So again, we're interfacing with people over small things that make re a really big difference in their life. Then my job is also to provide full spectrum medical care for that like small amount of chronically homeless patients who are a big utilization of the system, who are big, big utilizers of the system. You know, in my real day-to-day -day job, I also take care of all kinds of people who are housed and, you know, are wealthy and live in the hill towns and live in the Berkshires and live in Amherst, but my sort of superpower is understanding all these weird idiosyncratic steps that folks have to to take to get them out of homelessness and how the medical system has to be accessible to them, as particularly when many patients have had a really paternalistic, um, you know, bad experience with healthcare where, you know, medical treatments were sort of given to them that they may not have wanted um, in either a psychiatric or emergency room sort of setting. So. Um, being able to interface with all of these folks in a way that's not just on Zoom every two weeks or um, <laughs> via our cell phone constant conversations uh, would be phenomenal. Right now, you know, Andy's team and I, I sit with them generally at lunch for sort of like an ad hoc case management meeting, but to have more stability to that would be so helpful. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of times, especially with health crises, things come up that aren't every two weeks, right? So um, this, this hub is going to be so important. Our schedule on Monday, when we already provide these services at MANA, is overflowing. We have increased our um, community health workers who are there providing access to insurance, mass health. Um, we also work with staff and EBT, things like that, um, and we have folks there as much as we can, but to have a dedicated space where we're not working in a church library would be phenomenal. Um, so that's why I'm excited about the hub. <laughs> I just have to say I'm in awe of everyone here on this panel um, and the incredible work that you all do. It's, it's really remarkable and it's often done behind closed doors and thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about the Division of Community Care and what we do, and we have a team of community responders that are able to receive people as they can walk in without any appointment, without any prerequisite. They don't have to show identification, health insurance, there's no bill um, or fee for service, and we provide urgent emergency type response needs, so that can be 
making a connection to one of these amazing providers, helping someone really de-escalate if they're experiencing a tough moment or distress or they found themselves in a situation that was unexpected. And we can all relate to that. Emergencies come up in people's lives and when you are struggling or you aren't as stable, it is sometimes crisis-like. And our main goal at the Division of Community Care is to mitigate harm and restore people's autonomy. So they have choice in what services that they want to engage with us. They have choice in being able to come back and establish a relationship. And I heard so many wonderful words, I don't want to repeat, but things like hope, trust, comfort, um, feeling supported, love, safety, those are all basic needs that we all have as people. And when you don't have one or many of those things and you don't feel seen and you don't feel that your needs might be met, sometimes that can evoke strong emotions, responses, trauma-like um, experiences can resonate with people through the way they might present in the way they need something. So the ways that we try and support these amazing providers is being an avenue of connection at the point of an emergency or to help avoid emergencies coming up. And in doing that, we've been able to find great pathways of doing outreach, regular communication with individuals, just like many of these providers were another layer of that. And sometimes if someone's been discontinued from other services, we're able to hold what people call a gap. Um, those gaps have been growing. They're wider. There's many more people that are experiencing distress themselves or in concern of someone else. And that's what the Division of Community Care aims to do, restore people's um, risks in reducing harm. So by doing that, we hope to be an incredible um, collaborator with everyone here at the Hub because when we do have emergencies arise or we do have unknown impacts on people that include the climate, include um, you know man-made or uh, natural disasters, we also want to be able to mobilize and respond in a very cohesive way. And this Hub is an anchor for us to think about many times what is lacking in equity for access to care or equity in how we communicate and just restoring of people through inclusivity, real community, community where there's no barriers, no judgments, and we welcome everyone to participate. So that's what we're super excited about the hub, is not only to be in service, but also to provide a space for community to, to plan for the things that we can reduce harm. Yeah, thank you all. This is, it's really amazing to hear about what each of your organizations do and, and how the hub will help amplify that. Um, and I, you're all experts and leaders in the space in different ways, and we know this is often really hard work, as you all spoke about. Sometimes it's, it's very challenging, um, and there's no sort of right way to do this. Um, but I've learned so much from each of you about some of the sort of best practices. What are the, some, some of the values that we hold when we do this? And, and I, I'm curious if you could all share. I'm not going to go down the line. I'll just kind of do this more popcorn style. Whoever, whoever wants to take it first. Um, what are some of the values, the core approaches that you want to bring to the Hub that you think will be really important to show up at the Hub in terms of how people experience walking into the space, how they experience accessing services, and, and what that could look like for them? Does anybody have a... a Hi. So again, Shadal Diaz from the Three County Continuum of Care. Um, we hold a lot of space within community. We collaborate with a lot of folks, especially those that are either actively um, unhoused or have uh, are chronically experienced unhoused before they were housed. Um, so we currently have a People with Lived Experience Action Board. And these are the folks that are at decision-making tables. And something that I'm super excited about is that um, that is going to be one of the points. Like there is going to be a uh, action board of some sort that is led by people that are the experts, right? They are the ones that have gone through these experiences. They have gone through our systems of care. They have interacted with caseworkers and service providers. So they're the ones that can tell us what's working and what's not working and having that be um, key is important to help um, further the engagement and the collaboration. Uh, 
So what we try to do at MANA is exactly that, let people's voices um, advocate for themselves and um, show them through like a, truly a zero barrier, zero judgment um, interaction that it is actually okay to ask for what you need. You, this is the one spot that is your spot. Um, you know, when Haymarket was here and, you know, people could hang around Haymarket, I had one of our guests say, I know that Peter would let me hang around Haymarket, but I can still feel that table looking at the back of my neck. So at MANA, like, our dining room and our drop-in center is your space. It's not, a, we're actually a guest there with you. And, you know, by, act, by acting that way, we're proving that, you know, you're, you don't have to be invisible in society, that you are one of us and we are actually here for you. Um, sometimes it's really hard. They don't believe that we're there for them. I had one of our guests tell me that, I don't want to ask for it because hearing no is worse than not having it because I know how to not have it and I've been living with it for ever. But to hear no when I ask for it is painful. And so that's what every day at MANA, what we try to eliminate is, and, and hear what our guests are saying, what would be helpful, you know. I know my name is Dr. Bossy, but I generally, I think a lot of our patient, my patients, have experiences with the healthcare system where the doctor knows best, or the person knows best. Like they don't listen to the the patient, and and I take a very different, you know, approach to healthcare. In that I have a lot of tools and ideas and med and knowledge, but I do not know best. It, the patient knows best, and I'm saying patient, but I generally think our team. Uh, thinks that way, and that's what we, that's certainly what I want to bring to um, medical care at the hub and what I like to bring to the hub. If I can piggyback on that, Dr. Bossi. <laughs> um, one of the things that I feel is really misunderstood is what access people have when a serious situation has arised and maybe what their past has informed them on what they could expect from the current systems of care. So I think about, in particularly, the, the medical and the access to emergency housing or a respite and then, you know, the, the hope, the belief that, um, I can be or do or have or, um, you know, really vision for a future of wellness for myself. And we see that people have a lot of experience within the system that we all work with. And there's many times the system has left people down. So we hope that the hub will be an avenue to avoid unnecessary ED trips to avoid unnecessary arrests or incarceration. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that those things happen to people that could be experiencing a medical episode of care that could increase their anxiety or their um, emotions that could be misperceived or escalate, as well as going to the emergency department and pleading and begging and, and really asking for things in care. And that is not the place that often can provide that connection to those care needs, um, especially in those settings where they're at capacity. And I just want to name that. If there was a real vision for the HOPE's effectiveness, it will be to reduce the burden on the system, which is overburdened, understaffed, and very fatigued, and then at the same time restore improving quality of life, hope, wellness, and having access to someone like Dr. Bossi can be an incredible game changer. It could really help someone understand that their health is as important to her as it is to them, and what are the small steps such as harm reduction strategies to help someone stay a little safer while they're in that process of determining what's best for them, which we hope to guide them with their voice. So I think the hub is a place where you have a power dynamic that shifts. It's not about 
caring for people, it's about caring about people with people. And I think that's what a lot of um, the messages these providers amplify in their daily roles, every space and place they can go is to advocate for people to be able to have the ability to, to care about themselves with us. Um, and that's really a different perspective for how people will engage. And we've seen them all you know, make incredible strides in progress when that's offered in a different way to help people um, really feel value for themselves by us and with them. So, just going to add one little thing. Another approach that we take that's different than traditional systems is the just enough approach. I hear over and over again from my um, mentally ill population that generally their experience with healthcare is like give all the meds all the time until it all goes away. Uh, they don't feel themselves. They don't even know that person who's completely over-medicated with, you know, zero voices. We do not take that approach. We take the just enough approach to just enough medication or treatment or whatever it is we're doing to prevent arrests, ER visits, harm, negative consequences. So it's a, and I think people really value that difference. And working together, we can all take that same approach and understand like what the goals of care are. And we can echo that to a person and work together. So that's another approach I like to take from the hub. Yeah, one of the things we talk a lot about at Cathedral is um, Everybody has needs and everybody has something to offer. So a lot of times people say to me, all I do is need. I have to ask, I'm, it's degrading. Um, and what we strive to do is, yeah, you, everyone sitting here has needs. Those of us that have privilege, a little bit harder for the world to see what those needs are and have an opinion on it. And so I just imagine the place where people can also not just receive care, but offer that to one another. I, that's what Shondell was saying. Like, we let people guide each other. They are experts. I don't know what it's like to have to go to 10 offices and be told no, and then have to find a bus to get back to where. I don't, I have never done that. But I know people in our community have, and that advice is better than anything I can offer. I create the space for that to happen in some small way. And, um, and what I really imagine from this hub is to give people a space not only to receive what they need, but offer the gifts they have. Um, to be able to teach other people, to create a space where their voices matter, where they can have more control, as Dr. Bossi has been talking about, over how all of this works. Um, that we can all, as organizations, be way more creative because we have better communication and we can troubleshoot more. Um, it's hard to be creative when you don't know the whole story and you're not a part of all the things. And there's sometimes we can't all be a part of each other's stuff, but I think that, that having us all under one roof will create a way that we can be more creative, that we can let people share their gifts and not just feel like they're always taking. Because that's, sorry, I'm editing my words, that's awful. It's awful um, to feel like all you are is asking and taking. Let us make this a place. And I'm thinking about all of the amazing things of each of these organizations. And this is just a teeny subset, I think, of who will be a part of it. Wouldn't it be great to take the best of each of our organizations and bring those together to make all of our organizations better? I'm always learning from what other people are doing in town and re-evaluating re the way that we approach things. Um, and to have a place where we can do that faster and quicker and better and more creatively, I think it will be amazing um, for our town and for everyone that uses the hub. I'm just gonna quickly add that I, I think one of the things that's special about this, that's different about this, is an opportunity for, you know, we're all sitting in a church right now, right? Community is built in spaces like this. And oftentimes we are working with the most vulnerable among us, right? But if we're bringing opportunities for the most vulnerable among us to be in community with people who are less vulnerable, then we, we build systems of care individually just in relationship. 
I'll be fairly brief. Um, I, I did want to touch on the fact that you know we we know that we can't do all of this work alone. Like at Elliot, we don't have housing for folks. We don't have income that we can give for folks. And so we, we recognize that we are interdependent on everybody else to do this work. It really takes every, you know, food stamps and social security and housing authorities and health care. It takes all of these things to, to be able to accomplish the mission. And, you know, I know, I think we, we, we're all similar in the fact that we prioritize relationships, relationships with the folks that we serve, relationships with other providers. Um, we know that our outcomes are better when our, as providers, we all have relationships and we can communicate and we can, um, we can take action on certain things. And so the fact that there could be a place where all of this can happen is really amazing. And I said earlier, it's really a gift um, is what it feels like to us because we saw in the pandemic where we had funding for a lot of things, a lot of housing, we were able to keep people in housing, we were able to expand capacity at shelters. But what we didn't have was humans. We didn't have people. We didn't have places to go with the people. And so we, were, we, were, we worked through the entire pandemic across... Um, hoods of cars, that we would just talk um, separated, but still outside and still meeting with people. And so the relationships that we have with folks are central. And so not everybody that we work with even really wants to have a relationship with us. And so it's really complicated. Um, it's really hard to sometimes figure out a pathway to connect with somebody. And so a lot of times, one of the strategies we use are um, providing need items. And so if, if we become a person that all of a sudden provided a, a, something that was really needed, that helps us form a relationship. Once we have that relationship, we have some trust. Now I feel like we're, we're at a place where we can work. And, um, and to, have, to have a system where we can you know, easily share with this person that's untrusting of the system, that may be disenfranchised, the system has kept them down, and we're the person now that they trust. We've, we've done the work, we've put the time in, and they trust us. And now there's a place that may also have that same effect, that there's a place where we can easily get somebody connected to food stamps and to uh, treatment and to health care and get back on their insurance. And so I think that we become that person to the folks we serve that they trust and, and they rely on. And I think this becomes a place for all of us to do the same kind of thing. And that, that's, I think, where I, where I think um, of this as a real gift for, for all of us and for our community. Thank you all. It's honestly inspiring just to hear you all talk about the different ways that your work and the values you bring will, will show up at the Hub. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, but then also if any folks in the audience have any questions, please write them on those cards and we'll come around and grab them um, and we can, we can ask some of the questions you all have. Um, yet, to your point, Andy, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this um, because it's such a uh, representation of the amazing organizations that already do this work in this area. And, and the hub really is just amplifying and creating a space for all of the work that already happens here to flourish even more. Um, and I, I know we've been talking a lot about how we'll provide services and kind of what the services are and what that looks like. Uh, but something we've all talked about as well in the past is how the hub will have an impact on Northampton more broadly beyond just coordinating services. And I know there's a lot of interconnected to this there, in, there between, as Dr. Bossy said, some of those folks who use services very frequently um, and how by supporting them we're actually supporting our entire community. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear more what you each think about the sort of broader impacts that the hub could have on Northampton and our downtown community. Um, and what will the, the process of coordinating services and resources do for us locally here? If anybody has a, a burning response they want to start with. Yeah. Thank you, Glad. Um, the one thing that we didn't mention so far on the panel is the many conversations that we have around individuals are their risks. And those risks that can include the risk of a loss of life. And I'm directly relating that to substance use and the impacts around um, overdose that we've seen in Northampton and consistently um, lost about 70 
I'm sorry, seven individuals a year to overdose death. And I see one of the people in the audience here is a friend, a colleague from the Northampton Recovery Center. There's so many organizations here within Northampton that will play a role in collaborating to help navigate people from the hub to their organization and helping people find um, support around the use of substances, reducing the risk of the loss of life and the many um, medical impacts that we know comes along with that. And one of the things also from COVID that I really feel resonated very strongly was um, looking at that intersectionality of people and the interconnectedness, if I said the right, interconnectedness, of you know what we use to diagnose or label people being this person has a substance use disorder, or this person has a challenge around mental or behavioral health, the visible and invisible um, wounds that people carry, and just really trying to look at that whole person. Um, during COVID COVID, it was so obvious that the complexity of people's physical and mental behavioral wellness needs really escalated. And when you look at the challenges that our community faces, that the risks um, also indicate that you can't really tease out one particular issue from another. So if it's um, vulnerabilities around housing, if it's vulnerabilities around substances, vulnerabilities around mental health, we're looking at that whole person and really trying to start at a place of harm reduction and keeping them safe, keeping people alive, and then looking towards how we can co uh, collaborate and um, look to find an individual's autonomy and what they feel is a priority for themselves in that given moment. So I just wanted to name that there is a literal risk of life right now that people face um, with the toxicity of substances, the risks and vulnerabilities, only increasing the complexity of people's needs and the reducing availability of services, especially not in this level of coordination. So we're really looking at an innovative model for Northampton to set the precedence of our values in the community and our value for you know people's quality of life and staying alive right now in a really scary and complex time for care. Two things. So Northampton doesn't have a federally qualified health center in North in Northampton. Um, so folks either have to go to Amherst or Holyoke. Uh, we are currently providing sort of a bridge one day a week for that problem. So that would allow our low income or un uninsured residents of Northampton to have a local resource. And a lot of times, if you don't have insurance, you don't qualify for something called PT1, which is a medical transport. So then you have to take the bus or try to get there somehow. Um, so that would really serve a, a large population or a broader population of Northampton. Um, <clears throat> that we are not serving. And then, of course, resources. So, I mean, the DCC and I have collaborated on some really complex cases where they're getting data from dispatch on who is utilizing EMS services and 911 calls. We um, worked we really throw our resources at those folks. Um, I, we have one woman um, who, this is just an example, had 91 police calls and interactions in the six months prior to our intervention, um, which included medications and my services and um, really the DCC establishing this incredible rapport. Um, and she also knew of me through her homeless friends, so there was a bridge there. Um, we got her on the right medications, we got her into the right type of housing, and she's had five police calls sent in, in the six months after that intervention. So that's 91 to five in six months. So that's saving all of our tax dollars. So I guess I could say from my point of view at MANA's impact on the greater community is so None of us in this room moved to Northampton to be alone and, and away from people. We moved to Northampton because it's a wonderful town that demonstrates community all the time. The hub being a very visible and concrete um, commitment by the city officials to make that real, to make that tangible that everybody can see. Um, I mean, that's when, when my ex-wife and I were moving 
somewhere and having a child. Like we chose Northampton because of all the good things it does for people. This is just yet another reason, and we, I feel quite blessed that there is a city administration that you know, is working towards this, that is going to do something different because it's the right thing to do and because it will be better for people. And you know, that's probably why we all bought houses in Northampton. And I'm just glad to be part of this. I mean, this is a necessary public health safety measure that the city is doing here. I mean, it is important in terms of community, but it is also for our unhoused and for vulnerable people, but it's also really necessary for this community, for this city to have a resource that is responsive, I think, you know, to environmental and emergency preparedness. And that's something that I think is, you know, an, an additional change um, that we don't have here. I also think that um, another way that it's going to be supportive of this city and um, of the people who live here is the support, I think, to downtown businesses here that the hub will offer because we are experts in working with a population of folks in need who are sometimes in the downtown area and a lot of our business providers don't necessarily know what to do to help somebody and so there's a place that they can go right there, right down the street um, and it doesn't, there's no eligibility factor, you know, it's not do you only make this much money, or are you only outside, or are you, you know, like, none of that matters. You just get to go. And so if you seem like you're in need, our business providers in the area can send you there and say, hey, there's an, a place for you to go right here. And I just want to throw out um, just some numbers, just so you can see the impact of homelessness in Hampshire County, not specifically Northampton, but in Hampshire County. Um, so the point in time count is uh, required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development that um, all COCs conducted annually on the coldest night in January. Um, and that is to survey those that are either sheltered or literally outside. And in the last four years, so in 2020, the number was 285. In 2021, the number was 210 COVID. In 2022, 234. In 2023, 240. And in 2024, 312. So we have more folks that are outside experiencing homelessness, more folks that are going to service providers. And this will ultimately just be a better way to coordinate services for folks and provide them somewhere that they can go to get everything that they need. Thank you. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think one thing I'll just add is, is we've noticed, as I'm sure everyone's paid attention, there's been more storms, more flooding, more heat waves in recent years, and the hub will provide an amazing space where folks can know they can go to get resources, get support, um, get some water, or get a place to charge your phone if your power is out. So I think there's a lot of ways the hub will be supporting everyone in, in a lot of different ways. Um, just the other day, I was talking to my sister who has two young children, um, and she was saying, man, I wish there was a place I could go just to change my son's diaper and get a meal. Uh, there's no place I, I can go. I, I have to spend money. I have to go downtown somewhere. So having a community center like this, I think, will really support a, a wide range of people in town. Um, I've got more questions I can ask, but I want to see if there's anyone here who had any questions. Um, does anyone have any that are, that are written down? Maybe we can grab some of them. I think there's, there's some in the back as well. Um, If any of you want to add anything else to this before, uh, while I read through some of these. Just a few. I just, I think it's important to note that there's a housing crisis everywhere and that this isn't just about 
chronically homeless individuals. I mean, that's like where I shine, but that's not the, va that's a very small population of who we work with. So folks that are at risk of homelessness, um, and I work with this population all the time, it's like 70, 80% is really this big chunk who are transiently homeless due to a layoff, a divorce, um, an injury. Um, I had a, I was talking to a patient yesterday who was working full time, two jobs, trying to make ends meet for an apartment that cost $1,200 a month. And he just got hit by a car. It was a hit and run. He can't even, like there's no insurance claim. He's laid up, um, you know, dislocated his hip, separated his shoulder blade has knee surgery and he's calling just in crisis like I don't know how I'm going to afford my apartment. Um, my partner's still working but we're now we're $300 behind. Like those are the folks we're also here to serve. Um, so and I think a lot of people can r relate to going through sort of a acute life crisis and just needing some resources and having one place to go when you only have one car or a car that's not really working um, and difficulty with those resources. So don't forget about that giant population <laughs> that we're also here to serve. <laughs> this is testing my powers of synthesizing information quickly. Um, there's a couple questions here, kind of one theme that's coming out is around environmental resilience and how having a space like this helps service providers like yourselves um, address some of the needs that come along with climate change and environmental resilience, things like heat waves, flooding, um, and power outages, things like that. And there's a question that's really asking about how can the hub help directly address some of those needs? What will having a physical space do to enable some of y'all to better address those things that when they come up? Well, one initial thought is that when the weather is bad, it's bad for all of us, but it's really bad for the friends that we have outside. And so having a space like this means a place for somebody to go indoors and be safe um, when the weather is terrible, just to dry out if they've been out all night. Um, and then I also think about the opportunity to provide training to folks that are outside in these spaces um, when we're talking about weather emergencies. Um, you know, one of the things we scramble to do every year when there are weather emergencies in the winter is to, you know, start a phone bank um, to try to get all the information out to everybody who's outside, who's hard to find, who's difficult. I mean, she just shared the count, the number of people who are experiencing homelessness. That count is done on a night, on a Wednesday night in January, the coldest days of the year. That is not counting all the humans that are actually experiencing homelessness. It's only the ones we could find on that particular night, right? So it's, it's an opportunity for us to provide training and resources, food, water, um, and I will also say, as a service provider that provides shelter, <laughs> that you know a lot of our homes and also places where people that we are serving are sleeping, you know, lose power. <laughs> and so we might need that resource too, you know, to send people uh, to safety, even folks that are staying indoors in our shelters. Yeah, I'm thinking, especially over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of flooding. Um, I got water in my basement, I'm going to be fine. Uh, we had people wading through water to get out of their tents safely as it was flooding around them. And um, I can't wait till we have a place with really big dryers. Um, we give out sleeping bags that get thrown away because you can't get mold out of them. Wouldn't it be great to have an industrial dryer and washer that could save some of those resources? And just imagine the fear of having to wade through water to get to safety. Uh, maybe people need a place to just feel safe after something like that. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. But it's hard. It's hard, I think, it's hardest on people that are un unsheltered. 
So on those like freezing cold days that come out of nowhere, um, those 300 and something people like go through my head like over and over and over again. And it's up to us to coordinate like, where's this person going? Where's this person going? Where's this person going? And then there's always one or two that we like don't know where they are. Um, and it's generally one of our jobs to find them. <laughs> uh, so, and we do, but we have really successfully prevented frostbite injury and hypothermic deaths since we've been working together. That has been an enormous improvement. Um, and those are really expensive um, injuries. Frostbite is an ongoing, prolonged, protracted um, process. So I will, hats off to us, um, having a community space to work together will continue to just improve that effort. Um, I'll also say, you know, we're not going to solve climate change here. We're not, we're the seven people here. Um, so we do not, I, I don't um, endorse that this is going to be the, you know, solution for climate change, but we can be very climate minded and providing one space for a bunch of different services um, will certainly reduce transportation costs and gas emissions to going to 10 different offices. So we can give you that as well. I'm so thankful for all the thoughtful responses because I think one thing that often is um, misunderstood is how much it takes to organize to respond to a climate emergency. And I tried to explain this a little bit in the second presentation is that often what is an emergency for our community is not a federally designated emergency. And that means that it's an emergency, it's very real, it has huge impacts, but there is no funding that comes federally to help offset costs or impacts or help provide assistance to people. And so, a of the presentation, we had the second um, round of these sessions. There was our um, new Kappa um, Climate Action Director. His name is Ben Weil, and he is incredible. I've been communicating with him as he's very new in his position, but very experienced in this work. And climate equity is a huge priority of the leadership of the city. We see this building as being able to be mobilized and transformed for emergency shelter needs. We see this building as being a staging area, as our fire chief was here, Chief Pilas, last session as well, talking about what it looks like to try and stand up an emergency shelter, especially if it's not federally funded. So we imagine this space um, within the Resilience Hub as being designed with this in mind, can be a convertible space. And then just to touch on the thoughtfulness around individuals that are stably housed. Of the people that we've really seen presenting um, recently, and I have a couple community responders here with me today, um, we see elders. We see a staggering amount of elders that are being displaced and facing eviction and have an incredible difficulty with no opportunity for um, enhancing their income because of mobility or physical limitations that often put them in a position of needing the benefits that they have and not being able to afford alternate housing find themselves unhoused. And then for those that are stably housed in our elder community, just staying on that population for an, a moment, we know that they make extreme sacrifices when the cost of heating or having an air conditioner running and the cost of electricity far exceeds what their economic uh, means are. So we see people go without heat. We see people go without running water, without um, fully functional septic systems because they can't afford to have them fixed. As the health department, we see an incredible amount of impacts that people are facing with the means that they have that find them in a very risky situation and we often don't know because it's happening behind closed doors. And then just lastly to say, you know, the, the heat just of late, the commodity of water, having access to water, it seems like it's one of the most inherent basic needs, but what we were seeing at the Division of Community Care was that people were utilizing water from the Connecticut River, the Mill River, as having a means to access water at any time for them, and that water is often contaminated and polluted, and so people have very, very significant medical care needs that result from drinking contaminated water. 
every time the water levels rise, the water becomes potentially contaminated. And so we have done a concerted effort to put up educational boards with our public health nurses on how to um, sanitize or use clean water. And then also, I think our most attractable <laughs> um, gift that we can offer the community sometimes is literally a bottle of, of water. And so I just want to reemphasize the most basic and primary of needs that people have are really impacted by um, the climate. Um, we see people with sunburns. We see people with, you know, obviously cool and cold-related injuries. And we really hope the hub can help mitigate um, those risks and vulnerabilities and be in an organized way that involves climate equity as well as the majority of of equity issues that we're all looking to to help solve problems from. I'll also just say I think we're all preparing for some type of environmental crisis and slash currently living that. Um, we recently just went through this global pandemic, which gave us this sort of preview of what it looks like when the world shuts down. And this team here, we somehow all you know, collaborated and got really creative on being able to still provide food, shelter, medical resources, and like basic necessities. So we don't know what's coming, but to have a collaborative space where we can tr troubleshoot and think through those things when they happen is going to be invaluable to the community because you have your leadership here who's done this before and has a lot of good experience working in one space. We have uh, so many other good questions here, but unfortunately, we're running short on time. And we want to just make sure we have a few minutes um, to hear from both Alan um, giving some updates from the city and Dory sharing some updates on the building renovation process. Um, so I, I want to just leave you all with this one other really interesting question that I wish we would have some time to talk about. But I encourage all of you here to ask um, some of the panelists here or speak to one another about this. Um, this question says, what do you think about whether or not we should give money to people who are on the street? I know there's a lot there. So um, I encourage you to talk to one another and ask some of these folks about their opinions about that question. Uh, but first, I just want to thank you all. Hope we can give them all a round of applause. Thank you all so much. Please, uh, we can all sit down now. And I'm going to turn it over to Dory and Alan to share some updates. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Dory Brooks. I'm a principal architect for the project uh, from Jones Witsit Architects. So we are a firm in, based in Greenfield that's been around for about 34 years, and we specialize in public architecture, um, community architecture, projects that build community is how I think of them. Uh, so we're drawn to this work uh, for a couple of reasons. I think of it as high risk, high reward. The, the risk, the challenge, is that we work on projects that require a great deal of public deliberation that largely we all have to contribute to, which means that we have to really engage deeply to be sure everyone feels heard and listened to and understands the substance of the problem that we're trying to solve with architecture. High reward because when that works and it's hard work, uh, it's deeply meaningful and, 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 uh, and we are very grateful for the opportunity. Um, so I've presented a lot already um, on previous sessions, but since there are people who are new, we wanted to be sure that we come with windows are established. So we kind of see that as not the highest priority at the beginning, but certainly something you know that that could be held out, but that but we'd want to be sure is done well. Um, so to the question, are there resources to help pay for this? I just wanted to note that on that diagram. Those areas that have a, a big orange star are things where there are, are resources available that are federal and state resources to support costs, largely having to do with sustainable systems. So HVAC systems in particular, utility systems, geothermal wells. So there's a lot of money out there to help alleviate the higher cost of doing a project with those resources. So rather than not do it that way, the thinking is to do it right and go after all of that money. And it's not a competitive grant often for some of that money. It's just that you absolutely have to be committed to it and ready to go. So 
So the orange uh, gets some resources from that level. Um, in red, we have resources that really are kind of more about partner agency assistance or more the programmatic potential of what the building is doing and, and finding resources around what's happening, what the hub is doing to support uh, you know, vulnerable populations. And there is a growing awareness that climate is impacting some people much more than others, and there's an interest in supporting that. So we know that there are some grants for that. And then finally in blue, that's where, you know, kind of focusing on the, um, the, the terrace and some of those core things that are basically the exterior, that's where logically you might go to community preservation or CDBG and some of these pools of money that already exist that the municipality has access to. So just a way of saying there's a lot of funding to support the project, but it takes time. <laughs> and I'll let Alan answer to that one further if there's any other questions on that. Um, project schedule, in the past I've very ambitiously said we're ready to go and we want to get to the where, point where we can be in construction, you know, by beginning of 2024 with a year of construction ahead of us. The reality is because the city has to make sure it has all the resources in play, it may not happen that way. So we're kind of starting to own that we have to slow down a little bit, um, bring an owner's project manager on, um, look at the capital needs for the project, and, and potentially do it in phases rather than all, all at once. So that's generally the overview of where we are. We're on pause as a design team a little bit right now. Um, we're doing some you know field investigation with different populations, talking to seniors and veterans and, and different groups while we're kind of waiting for the city to bring on an owner's project manager to help the project go forward. So anyone have any questions for me or for the design team? And if not, for, for Alan, who's here to represent the mayor's office, or good luck. Don't see any questions, but I want to. Uh, I know we're just over time. We're gonna in the last couple of minutes. We're just gonna share, building on what Dory was just saying around timeline. Sort of like what else is happening in the meantime. How community action is continuing to lead the project and make sure things are are moving forward. Um, so I just want to invite up the rest of my team uh, from community action to to come up here, and we're each gonna just share some very quick updates to give you a sense of what's continuing to happen in terms of programming and building the coalition of partners. Um, so we're you know, as you saw today, continuing to build relationships with a lot of the local service providers, um, local state agencies, community groups, um, as well as going to all of the local networking and coalition calls where this already happens, um, really making sure we're plugged into the local spaces where partners are already working together. Um, so we're really building those relationships, building those coalitions, um, as well as researching other projects around the state and the country that do, have, that have, they're similar to the hub, so we can learn from those who have done this work before us. Um, so in, in addition to working with partners and learning from others, um, we are also doing a lot of direct engagement with community members. Um, and so I'm going to pass it to Nan to talk a little bit about the community engagement work that we're currently and continuing to do. Hi, everyone. I'm going to resist the urge to talk really fast. <laughs> Thank you for staying over. Um, a lot of the work that I do is direct engagement, um, building relationships with the outdoor living community. A lot of this work can't take place, or move forward, or get traction if people don't feel safe to receive the help. Uh, continuing to formalize communication through an advisory board, ensuring the most marginalized have a voice in the process, and uh, keeping open communication with other groups and organizations that have similar boards like the Northampton Recovery Center, um, the Three County Continuum of Care, um, MANA Center, um, and also uh, collaborating with resources and service providers. I attend many coordination calls, um, but to make sure we're all in the know about exactly what's available, where, by whom, and who can access it best, um, it's, it's not a straight line. Um, Imagine if Northampton only had one grocery store. Somebody's needs wouldn't be getting met. Uh, so in the same vein around seeking housing, we have Northampton Housing Authority, we have the COC, we have CSO, Craig Stores, we have a lot of places that provide that. So um, navigating their housing needs. Embracing people's differences um, helps us move away from needing an option for everyone and opens doors for everyone to, accept, to access their options. Um, many regional service providers 
have locations here in Northampton. We have growing organizations that are putting their footprint here as well, knowing where all these resources are while also meeting people where they're at and not just geographically helps people know when and how someone uh, may be served by a different organization. And remaining in communication with regional resources uh, to ensure that we know when and how to collaborate with those partners and to address issues that show up in Northampton and have an impact regionally. Um, and also I do advocacy work, <laughs> um, bringing uh, an advocate lens to the table and those marginalized voices into the car conversations, making sure um, that uh, their topics and things don't fall through the, the cracks and um, ad advocate for the needs of people that can sometimes be overlooked. Um, development of projects and programs, and I'll be quick about this, but this is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, we do host a community breakfast um, on Friday mornings. It's at First Churches from 7 to 9 a.m. And um, it's not entirely about the food, as we heard you know, Lee talking about earlier as well. Um, when so many interactions with others are transactional or based on need, uh, solutions, or it becomes habitual to see people through their needs. Uh, often people seeking services experience social poverty and there's a heavy focus, as there should be, on resource allocation, um, connecting people to what they need to stabilize their lives. And at our breakfast, we build community. Simply hold space for people, um, that's true resilience. Um, when the money's gone, we still have the relationships. So um, we see people as whole individuals and not just as somebody who has a need. Um, social poverty is easily deprioritized in the face of meeting others' survival needs. In order to survive, humans need air, water, food, shelter, and love. Human connection is essential. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. I will keep this brief because I know we're running over and I'm sure everyone wants to get home. Uh, we do really appreciate you being here today. My name is Caitlin. I'm the community health coordinator for the Hub. Um, so my role is kind of a mix of some of the like bigger systems thinking and operational planning for what the Hub is going to look like once it's up and running and in operation, which means building relationships with partners and working together with my team to kind of come up with things like a staffing plan um, and just like what that's going to look like when it's really running, as well as sort of some of what Nan does, which is directing or connecting directly with the community that we work with. Um, and while I am the, the health coordinator, I kind of view health as kind of a larger, broader concept that involves multiple aspects of people's lives. And I'm really trying to take a harm reduction approach to that. And right now, what that looks like for me is connecting with our most vulnerable folks in the community, which are folks who are living outside, um, and helping them to create a safer and healthier space to live in, which includes things like trash removal from encampments, making sure that folks have supplies that they need to either stay cool in the summer, stay warm in the winter, um, just have a generally safe um, space to live in. And a lot of that work is connecting with local service providers and helping them connect to services that already exist. Because there are so many people here who are doing a lot of really good work, and it can be really hard for folks to connect to them. So in building relationships and building trust with folks, I'm able to really connect them to services. Thank you. Hi folks, my name is Kate, um, and my work with the Hub is to build relationships with uh, other pieces of the community that aren't um, experiencing the most the most vulnerable experiences or the most marginalized. So for 14 years, I owned a business in downtown Northampton, so I'm delighted to be able to leverage that relationship and that history with the business community to bridge the gap and explain what we're doing at the Hub, explain, as you all heard, how powerful this project is for the entirety of our community. We we are all part of this community. We are all part, we all interact with downtown. We're all part of the economy. Um, and it's it brings me great joy to be able to bridge the business community as what well into um, the amazing work that the human service and social services community do. There's a lot of siloed um, populations in Northampton. We don't often know the good work that is being done, so it, it's um, my, my honor to be able to, to share that. Um, some of the work that we've been doing, we have 
worked with the Chamber and the Downtown Business Association to do some walkabouts with um, the business community. We'll be planning some more of those this summer. Um, and then going out to um, the housed residents, working with the city councilors and the wards. We have some planned um, ex uh, outreach um, to make sure that everyone in our community understands the scope of this project and that it truly is a community center for everyone. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being here, staying some extra time, and we'll stick around. If you have questions you want to talk more, please come up and, and find us. Thank you all so much.